Welcome to our uh, last research conference for 2013. It's always nice at the end of the year to take stock of some of the, the highlights and set a vision for the future. And, and it's a real pleasure to intru introduce our disruptor in chief, doc <laughs> Dr. Califf, who, um, with my short time at Duke, it's always been um, really fascinating to see how he's always ahead of the trend. And he's going to describe some work related to the Healthcare System Collaboratory the coronet, and probably an, a number of other things that will <coughs> help help set our sights for the, the, next, the coming year. Thanks, Abdul, and it's, it's always great to come back uh, to the DCRI. I don't get over here enough, but it um, always brings me a good feeling <coughs> to be back in this uh, environment. And I'm especially excited about the topic today. This is a really um, uh, interesting time for those of us who felt the need for a transition in the way clinical research is done, especially in the United States. And um, I'm unusually optimistic at this point. So um, I want to start out by just saying there are uh, dozens to hundreds of people I could acknowledge. So I'm trying not to acknowledge any individual because it wouldn't uh, be fair. But the work I'm going to present doesn't represent my work. And in fact, it so much doesn't represent my work that I've liberally stolen slides from some people and don't even know I took their slides. So um, I, I want to acknowledge that at the beginning. And I want to apologize for anything I'll say that's wrong about the slides. There probably will be a lot of things that could be interpreted uh, differently. So um, I really think of this as creating a new fabric. You know, when we do things in life, we generally operate uh, within a system which is not prescribed by us, it's prescribed by a set of rules and uh, increasingly a set of technologies. And um, if we just think about um, prior to the internet, that's an easy example to think about. Clinical research has existed under a set of rules and technologies that are, uh, in my view, completely outmoded at this state. And uh, um, we're now in a situation where uh, there are many factors at play to tell us that we're not delivering to society what it really needs or could have uh, that could be delivered um, by what we now know. So my conflicts in this case, um, as I always like to say, you can find my interactions with what's been called industry um, on the DCRI website. But the major uh, conflict I have in even thinking about this topic is that I feel like I've done really well and made a very good living mastering the old style clinical research. And making it um, work, or what I call the parallel universe of clinical research. And I think within this context, it's really been the mainstay of what's built the DCRI and my personal reputation. I was introduced yesterday at the NIH as the person most knowledgeable about clinical re uh, trials in the United States. And I was sitting there thinking, I know a lot about something that should go away as quickly as it possibly can. <laughs> but. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about at least my thoughts about that, and um, for those of you uh, who listen carefully to what Uptal said, I usually am ahead of my time, sometimes so far ahead I'm completely wrong, and at other times so far ahead that I get excited about things about five or ten years before they're actually going to happen. I also would point out that my uh, views of where things are headed are pretty disruptive to healthcare delivery. They're no different than things that we've talked about for years. I remember when Bob Jones was essentially the chief medical officer. I don't think that was exactly the title at the time, but that's what it was. And he was espousing many of these ideas 15 or 20 years ago. And uh, it's kind of interesting that even today, if you go into meetings in the health system, a lot of people who are very smart, uh, who are just busy doing their job, still um, have trouble seeing how all this is uh, going to work. So first, just a very brief note about history, <clears throat> so you'll understand where I'm coming from, from those of you who are new. This is uh, what computers looked like when I started. Um, a computer took up a whole room. You had these um, tapes and uh, various things that um, had to be um, dealt with. Um, and essentially, the job was to take uh, clinical medicine, which existed in forms like this. This was the old logbook in the coronary care unit and to put it on computers. And in fact, one of my first real lessons about computers was um, what happened was that um, essentially word processors didn't exist. And so our brilliant people decided we can use a computer to just record what people are writing by hand. So what people were writing down was typed into a computer and printed out. And there was a complete 
mutiny on the part of the doctors that uh, these computers were uh, incorrect and inaccurate and not uh, telling the true story, but it was exactly what they had written in the chart. But very early on, we were doing what a lot of people are aspiring to do, and I met with a Bay Area company today that wants to get its hands on our data for business purposes to produce uh, predictive estimates of what will happen to people. And this is a circa 1978 prognostogram, um, which we actually did commercialize. We sold it to insurance companies to help fund the data bank in the uh, good old days. But you can see a set of characteristics and then a predicted outcome with medicine and surgery. And I was so sure about this that I thought really sexy men like Dan Mark and I could um, <laughs> stand behind computers and talk to patients. And you can see on this graph, uh, this is a, a prediction for an individual patient over time of the expected survival of medical and surgical therapy uh, done uh, many, many years ago. And uh, these are many of the people to whom I owe the um, ideas, which I'm now seeing uh, playing out many years later. Uh, many of you will, uh, will, will uh, recognize Dr. Stead who lived uh, well over age uh, 90, still a fountain of great ideas, and many other uh, people who were really uh, critical to, the, uh, to our origins as uh, an entity and predicted many of the things that are now, I think, possible. My very first uh, journal article was in the Western Journal of Medicine with Bob Rosati, who was uh, the mentor who uh, uh, got me through the uh, couple of years of fellowship that I did. And there are two things about this that, as I reread it last night, really uh, stood out to me. The first is how overly optimistic I was about how quickly things would change. Because in 1980, I thought, you know, we should have done this years ago. There were reasons why it wouldn't happen, but now we can do it. Um, well, here we are, 30-something years later, and we still really haven't done it. And the other thing is the last uh, sentence which if you're following um, the hearings about the San Francisco airplane crash last year and what really went on in the cockpit before the plane crashed, you had pilots talking about their lack of comfort about steering the plane down in the absence of um, the, auto, the autopilot function. And so when they had to do it, they actually were uncomfortable and couldn't handle it. And that, uh, at least from what I'm hearing, is really the genesis um, of the crash. And so. The point of all this is that um, the, the modern versions that we're talking about now are really meant to help people make good decisions, but it's not in any way going to replace the need for human beings. And in fact, I think the need for a different type of healthcare professional who can now use decision support in practice is really what we need to be thinking about in our educational system. And so what happened uh, when my prediction that this would come into place in the 1980s uh, went bust is that uh, there was a period of rapid evolution of parallel universes. And what I mean by that is that um, there were uh, reasons why clinical practice and clinical trials especially went in opposite directions. The first was a, uh, an argument based on ethics. That is, um, the view was uh, that um, because of some ca catastrophic things that happened in clinical research, that um, researchers were only interested in uh, human beings as subjects. That's where the sort of subject term comes from, that we're interested in getting the answers. We don't really have a primary interest in the welfare of the human beings, and so we have to be regulated and overseen. Whereas in clinical practice, um, the bond between, at that time, it was called the patient and the doctor. Now it's gotten a little more complicated in terms of exactly to whom the bond exists, but the view was that clinical care always kept the primary interest of the patient in mind. And we've had numerous conferences over the last couple of years to talk about how that construct now can be called into question. And then uh, we had the data. And essentially what um, happened is that um, when the sloppiness of routine clinical care data became evident to everyone, a view developed that to have accurate data, you had to have an army of people who created a parallel universe of data, initially on paper and then on the fax machine, and then eventually in electronic um, data capture systems that were separate from clinical care, uh, much more accurate and much more quality controlled because the data elements were defined ahead of time. So the end result of all this is that we now have a clinical research system that's a, an expensive industry alongside clinical practice with purposeful separation 
where possible. Then as we went through that era, though, there were irresistible forces telling us that this is, in the long run, not the right way to do things. It couldn't possibly be. Because if the goal of human studies and human experimentation is to inform uh, the best care of people, um, if you do those studies in a parallel universe which is not embedded into clinical care, you're on a great risk of getting an answer which is not relevant to the care of patients. And in fact, um, it was our exposure to uh, the early heart attack studies that I think taught us a lot about this now in retrospect. For reasons that I still don't understand, it became a cultural expectation that when a patient came in, particularly with an ST elevation heart attack, very high chance of dying, it was a cultural expectation around the world that people would be randomized into a clinical trial to try to find the next best treatment. And when we learned what the effective treatments were, and we've sort of forgotten that most of what we tried didn't work. So it's sort of a view that somehow magically we knew the best treatment for heart attack. It really didn't happen that way. We went through a number of studies that essentially failed in terms of the therapy being effective. Um, but when we learned what worked, uh, we then embedded uh, that knowledge into clinical practice guidelines. Uh, the guidelines led to performance measures. Many people in this room uh, uh, really led that effort. In the center of all this is a system of measurement and education. I don't know why that happened in one field. It's happened in several others, but for the most part, it hasn't happened. And so you have a world of clinical practice that goes about its own way, and you have a world of uh, research which is generating findings of questionable, va questionable value when they're actually applied to clinical practice, and I'll say more about that later. The NIH about a decade ago caught into this, and my, my uh, lecture at the NIH yesterday was the Stephen Strauss Memorial Lecture. Steve um, was uh, an institute director at the NIH. He had a huge impact on me because he was always so enthusiastic about the NIH roadmap. So this is almost exactly a decade ago. And a lot of people came to realize that the segregation of activities as opposed to the integration of activities was creating a major problem in be, being able to translate knowledge into useful uh, therapeutics and diagnostics. And so the NIH set about a plan. Um, I still find this to be an extremely useful construct that you think about all the bench science that's going on. A few things make it to be useful at the bedside, and there's a whole system and I, I won't go into it today, but I hope over the next year we'll uh, bring ourselves back to the bench to bedside part of this where I still think things are really broken and difficult. Um, and then uh, even after you, you get into clinical trials, most things still fail, but those that succeed, we have a terrible time getting them into practice. So the question is, how do we um, overcome this? A number of things were started a decade ago, which I think are just now beginning to happen. So sort of the fun, I had yesterday <coughs> was I took Steve's slides from a lecture he gave in 2003 that had a huge impact on me, and I just showed his slides for the first 10 minutes, and it pretty succinctly described exactly what we're trying to do now. This is a slide I've shown over and over, um, um, as opposed to being um, uh, completely dejected about it. I'm now enthusiastic that uh, 10 years later, maybe over the next decade, this will happen. So if you look at the far right-hand corner um, of this, you'll see a national clinical research system that creates effectiveness data that moves rapidly into the community, data and outcomes on, on outcomes and quality of care, a sustained efficient infrastructure to rapidly initiate large trials, scientific information for patients, families, and advocacy groups. So remember that as we go uh, through it. There are a number of building blocks to get there. The technology has happened. The building blocks are in place. Uh, the culture hasn't quite gotten there yet, and I think that's really the major um, effort. And since money is a chemo attractant in medicine, um, money is going to be applied to this in a way that uh, we've not seen before. So I think Steve's favorite slide here was this uh, sequence, which I have shown over and over for a decade <coughs> because I believe in it so much, but because, and also because it's so hard to accomplish. In the good old days, if you were the coordinating center, you were the king or queen. Uh, you controlled the data. You had all the sites out there. The quality of a site was judged by whether they followed your orders as written in the protocol. And it still mostly is that way, the way clinical research is done. 
Uh, we and others learn through uh, globalization that sometimes people in other countries don't want the U.S. to tell them what to do, and maybe they want to have their own independent coordinating centers and share the data. And I think we very successfully, not without a lot of um, complexity and difficulty, but successfully uh, created systems now where coordinating centers in different parts of the world can share data. But where we're really headed is what I, I now call the Walmart of medicine. What we really need is a situation where no matter where you get your health care, um, you end up in a system where the data get used to um, decide what the best thing is for the next patient. And it actually is only in the last several years that this has gone from being sort of a complete pipe dream to now being reality because we just could not have possibly handled the data until um, now. Now actually ending up with a system like this is still a bit of a pipe dream. It's not going to happen tomorrow and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about the intermediate steps at least as we see them. So now to remind everybody what's the problem we're trying to fix because uh, particularly academic medicine is full, full of a lot of people who are quite happy. They've gotten promoted to their next level. They may have tenure. They know what they're doing every day. They come into work and uh, they're not really particularly interested in being disrupted by other ways of doing things especially if they're in a position now where they control a lot of data or access to data, they've got the premier position. So what's the problem with that? So I always have to start with this slide, and I think particularly today, because I'm not saying that things are terrible. Things are much better than they were. And before 1950, they got better every year because of mostly very broad public health measures. But in the last uh, 60 years, it's been mostly uh, about half public health measures and about half uh, medical care. So I'm not saying things are terrible. What I am saying though is that things are terrible compared to what they could be because we now can do things a lot better. We still have a situation where we start out with five to 10,000 compounds and up, end up with one and at least a third of those end up with a major safety problem after they get on the market. Um, we have a huge gap between what's known biologically um, and what we are applying in terms of public health. This is a slide from the NIH recognizing uh, the extent of the problem just this year. Um, and the cost of doing anything has skyrocketed beyond uh, what we can afford. For those of you who follow computers, you'll recognize that Eroom's law is Moore's law backwards. So clinical research is the inverse of computing. Uh, to get each little element done in computing, there's a predictable uh, improvement uh, where the cost comes down dramatically every year, whereas um, with uh, clinical research there's a predictable um, regression where the cost goes up predictably every year. So um, and in addition to that, most of the questions that a reasonable patient or doctor or uh, nurse practitioner or healthcare administrator would ask are completely unanswered. And if you don't believe that, look at the field where we've done the most research, which is lipids. Dr. Pensino was involved, as I understand it, in the very controversial new guidelines that just came out. And there are a lot of interesting things to discuss, but to me, the real main point of those guidelines was that for many of the most important questions, we just have no earthly idea. So the concept that not a single trial has been done that um, really uh, answered the question of is it better to treat to target or not when that's been in the guidelines for 15 years, is really quite remarkable. So we're largely ignorant about what we're doing despite all the great things that we've done, which uh, tells you how much better that we could do. In addition, uh, to get a little more on the negative side, uh, this is another NIH slide. Um, societies begin to ask questions, not just about whether we're asking the right questions, but whether we're honest with our results. And We've had our own uh, events here at Duke that have put us in the spotlight uh, on this issue. But it's, this is well beyond Duke. And we now have um, big pharma companies publishing that 70% of what they buy from academia turns out to not be reproducible. So this is not 70% of research. This is 70% of research that gets to the point where there's a licensing agreement that leads to a purchase of the technology from academia. And so we need a system which is not only answering the right questions more rapidly at a lower cost, but which is also reliable, something that people can depend on to get the right answer. And then finally, the implementation side, and these are slides from George Mensa, who's spoken here a couple of times over the years, who's now the head of implementation 
science at NHLBI. And as a country, um, I, I love the quote I heard uh, in a policy meeting last week about biomedical science. And the quote was, we invented it, but we don't produce it. So we're inventing things that the rest of the world is figuring out how to use much more effectively than we can. So if you look at the leading cause of death and disability in the world, we're 18th or 19th in almost every category compared to the 19 competing economically developed countries. So um, if you've got a lot of money in the U.S., you can do quite well. If you're an average person in the U.S., you're uh, worse off than almost any other country. That is, if being alive and functional is your primary uh, goal. <laughs> now, since no one seems to care about men's health, I'm going to pick on the women here. Um, and this startles people. I actually didn't realize this until George showed it. But if you said, we're in a league where uh, we only compare ourselves to ourselves, you'd say, we're doing really well. That's U.S. women, likelihood of survival to age 50 in the red dots. But look what's happening with every other economically developed uh, country. Uh, we are losing ground compared to the competition, and the gap is widening. So we have a problem at almost every step of translation, which we have not solved over the last decade, and we need a disruptive solution that makes a difference. But this is not only a, a female issue, it's an issue uh, about where you live, what the color of your skin is, and your uh, sex. And so you can see here in uh, Chris Murray's uh, Eight Americas uh, depiction that your uh, chances of being alive if you're an Asian uh, woman uh, are pretty high, life expectancy of 88. If you're a black man in the far uh, bottom left, uh, life expectancy of about 65. That is, even I can do the math there, that's a 23-year difference in life expectancy. Now, um, I, I think people have different views about why that's happening, but I think as a country, it's pretty hard to look at this and feel that uh, the way we're currently doing things is adequate. All right, so what's the fundamental transformational concept? At, at this policy meeting in Washington last week, about half the uh, policymakers said, this is pretty simple. We just need to have primary care like Europe has, and we'd be fine. Well, everybody said, uh, that ain't going to happen in the United States. And that actually, if you ask me, that would be a pretty good solution, but um, it's not going to happen. So we need to come up with a different approach. And the approach that is going to be tried is called the learning uh, health care system. And to me, the real fundamental concept here is not uh, rocket science. It's something we experience in everyday life. Uh, now we all go in, and our doctors are recording things in computers. Uh, the computers are capable of compiling things in a way that allow people to analyze the data to uh, feed back so that the next time we come to see the doctor, um, we'll be treated more effectively and more efficiently. That is, if the data is used for good. Um, purpose. And so in the learning healthcare system, uh, information collected in the process of routine clinical care uh, would be the basis upon which we learn and accrue knowledge. And this is something that's happening in every successful business in the United States today. For a variety of reasons, uh, healthcare has lagged uh, far behind. The Institute of Medicine has done a great job in advancing the theory, uh, but in practice, you all know, with our own complexity here in the Duke Health System for those of you who get your health care here that um, we're not there yet in terms of making this a reality. So what gives us confidence that this is the right time to at least really start the transformation? And I'm just going to give a couple of examples that um, our institution has been involved in that um, do make me feel good, uh, that things can happen in a way that I could not have imagined. First is called the Sentinel System, and uh, you've all heard about this. But, um, I, you know, don't ask me to explain Congress, but they said, uh, FDA, you're required to aggregate 100 million electronic records in the United States. And uh, the FDA hired um, Harvard Pilgrim to do it. They came down and hired Leslie Curtis and other people to work on it. And um, I was told a couple of weeks ago that we now have access to 150 million electronic records. Now, you know, that's almost half of America. Uh, almost no one knows this is happening because uh, it's done under the public health exception to the need for informed consent. But to me, the real message here is not that this is going to give us the detailed information we need for a phase three 
clinical trial, but more that the scalability of using electronic records is not a technical impossibility now. It really can be done, and it really can answer useful questions. And one thing that's sort of critical about the American way compared to, let's say, Denmark or Sweden is that um, uh, the people who worked on this figured out fairly early that if what they were going to require was that people like Aetna and United um, take their uh, highly valuable healthcare data from uh, people they insure and moved it into a data warehouse where it would be combined with everybody else's data, that this was not going to work, that they were not going to give up their data. And so what was figured out was that the way to handle this is to let people keep their data and only ask them for the data that's absolutely needed to answer a question. So this is fundamentally different than what a lot of people have talked about, at least as best I can understand it, because it, it is a complicated set of ideas, fundamentally different than trying to create an enormous national data set that has every healthcare item about every individual in it. I would still believe that's an ultimate goal, but that may be our 10 or 20 year goal, whereas what we're talking about now needs to be a one or a two year goal to really get started. So this is uh, happening. And the second reason is this project that we're sort of celebrating today, the Healthcare Systems Research Collaboratory, and it was, it was really sort of a surprise to me when the RFA came out for this about a year and a half ago. It looked like it was written for us in 1978. And um, when I uh, initially saw it, um, I went back to discussions that had occurred in the old CERTS project, the Centers for Education, Research, and Therapeutics, where they took a bunch of us who were trialists and threw us in with a bunch of health services researchers and asked us to solve some problems. And uh, the middle ground between us was really the pragmatic clinical trial, the concept that you could use techniques like cluster, randomization, use electronic health records, and answer questions more quickly uh, that would be of great utility. So I immediately called Rich Platt, who was the person I'd spent the most time with, and we concluded we should go in together um, on this RFA. And a number of people in this room have helped make this happen, but um, this project has really, um, I, thought, I think, caught the imagination of a lot of people. And the construct is basically a constellation of pragmatic clinical trials embedded within healthcare systems involving electronic records being done at the fraction of the cost of traditional um, clinical research. Now, in fairness, these projects are hand-picked with people who are really good at doing this kind of work already and have systems that they had worked really hard on before um, applying. So this is really meant to be a demonstration that this kind of project can actually be done uh, at a much lower cost uh, in a much more effective way in terms of translating um, into practice. So you see the seven projects here that um, started out and just yesterday an announcement was made that five of them are going forward uh, full steam um, into uh, the implementation phase of the project after a year of planning. Our main job in this um, is not typical for a coordinating center. Our job is to learn from what everybody else is doing. It's a pretty privileged position to not actually have to deliver a clinical trial, but talk to everybody, see what's going on, try to figure out what it means, and um, write it down. And so in our design, we uh, came up with seven uh, working groups, each focused on a particular topic. Again, many people in the room are involved in this effort. But over the next five years, our job is really to produce pretty comprehensive uh, living uh, text and portal that has everything on it that you'd want to know um, if you wanted to do health system-based uh, clinical research using electronic records. Also, very importantly, from the beginning, we've had the full support of federal agencies. And many of you know how hard this is. Uh, federal agencies um, don't necessarily always agree with each other. Um, they all have uh, different missions uh, and agendas. But I'll have to say in this effort, um, every one of these agencies has put their weight um, behind the effort and has really supported uh, what we're trying to do. Our deliverables are the demonstration projects, which are now um, underway. And there's a, a response to an FOA, which is uh, going to be judged uh, in March. Um, and this, this is the, the next round of clinical trials. This is really going to be fascinating because 
you have to have a proposal for a practical clinical trial involving people with multiple comorbid illnesses at the same time. And many of you in the clinical trials world know that um, typically in the past, clinical trials have worked hard to exclude people with a lot of other diseases. Um, there's a lot of a good reason why uh, there's concern that we need to include people with other diseases and figure out how to do trials that are relevant to the populations where the action really is. But you can imagine the complexity now if you take somebody with a stroke, diabetes, and cancer at the same time, try to put them in a clinical trial with a practical um, answer coming out of it. So it's going to be kind of fascinating to see uh, what gets done. One nice thing about both of the coordinating centers I'm going to talk about, we have no role in selecting the projects. We're not judges. So um, we get to do the good stuff. There's a review committee that has to pick the winners uh, and, and those who need to uh, reapply in the competition. Um, as I've said, we have a knowledge repository and, um, and, and we're working um, really hard on that. One thing that happened this year that we've talked about in this research conference is the support trial controversy, but we already knew and in fact had been pretty much consumed by the ethics and regulatory issues in the first year of the collaboratory. Um, and so if you, if you really think about it, let's assume that we can conquer the data issues and let's assume that um, doctors and nurses and other practitioners and patients are all interested in getting questions answered. Um, we have a very cumbersome regulatory and ethics system now that's very hard to navigate and incredibly expensive. But at the same time, it's absolutely critical that we um, adhere to the principles of uh, having people have control over their data and also over what they participate in. So the good news here is that the NIH has just funded um, a number of empirical ethics projects and uh, uh, some of you have been involved in empirical ethics projects before. I think they're amazingly interesting and fun. Uh, three of the four projects that were funded are collaboratory projects. Uh, the biggest one, uh, Kevin Weinford is the co-leader of with Jeremy Sugarman, who used to be here but now is at Hopkins. Um, and this is really to develop a nationally representative uh, picture of what uh, people think, including all the various players, patients, research participants, IRB members, healthcare providers, and administrators, starting with focus groups and then moving to a nationally representative sample. The group at Penn, which is doing uh, a dialysis trial I'll talk about in a minute, um, is looking at this really interesting issue of um, that, that really became a big issue in the support trial, and that is uh, when you go to your doctor uh, or your nurse practitioner, what, you know, different systems now, um, that person, um, in theory, is making the best decision for you as an individual taking into account all information. If you enter a clinical trial, now you're under a protocol where your uh, treatment will be randomly allocated to one or another. And uh, the question is, how do people feel about uh, the role of physician autonomy in terms of uh, risk? And in particular, this pertains to randomization to one of two treatments, each of which would be completely within the standard of care. So let's say I went to see Optal and then I went to see Optal's colleague. They recommended two different treatments. Both were FDA approved and I'm the same person and I'm wondering why don't they know what the right treatment is. Um, the best way to find out is to randomize to one treatment or another. I think we all agree on that. But the question is, has the patient lost anything uh, by being um, randomly allocated as opposed to uh, the physician using judgment. And um, it's going to be a fascinating uh, snapshot of what Americans think. And then the second big question being uh, run by the group um, which is working on uh, infection control in hospitals with Columbia HCA um, is uh, how do people uh, view the divide between uh, quality improvement and research? Uh, the group I was meeting with today from the Bay Area is coming in, not approaching our research organization, but approaching our health system saying, we can develop data mining algorithms that can allow you to take better care of your patients. Everything they want to do looks like research to me, except they don't need consent because they're doing it as a business uh, aspect of the health system. Do people think that's okay, whereas if you do research, and of course the big difference is when you do research, you take a um, you agree that you want to make it generalizable knowledge, so you're going to tell people about it, whereas in the business case, no one needs to know about it. How do people feel about that? 
And then the CTSA consortium is going to do a study really focusing on uh, children, but overlapping a lot with uh, project number one. One of the interesting things about this is there'll be two, two nationally representative surveys, but done by two different methods. So it'll be sort of fun to see in the overlap part of it whether nationally representative surveys really are nationally representative and get the same uh, answer. So just an example of a collaboratory project that's kicking off this month. It's a question of how long should your dialysis uh, run be? Now you might think we would, should know the answer to that. Opto will have to explain later why nephrologists don't know the answer to that, but they don't. And so uh, in this trial um, led by Penn, but interestingly, the collaborators here are the two for-profit dialysis companies that own about 80% of the dialysis units in the U.S. So part of what we're beginning to see is that for-profit medicine, Columbia ACA is another big player in here, is seeing the need to get questions answered in a practical way that can inform their practice about what's best. And they're participating often more readily than academic medical centers do, which is sort of an inversion of the way you might think it should be. And so um, this uh, trial is a mortality trial. Um, and it's being done for under $5 million. So if you think about a typical uh, mortality trial where the ma majority of deaths are cardiovascular, we're not doing them for under $5 million now. Now how can they do this? The reason is because the uh, U.S. renal data system already is collecting very refined data on most of these people and all the trial really needs is the insertion of randomization and a bit of additional um, data collection. And of course the cooperation of the healthcare provider entities. So um, a lot of the knowledge now is being uh, put into this uh, living textbook. We had a really interesting dis discussion last Friday. Um, every uh, Friday now we have what's called a Grand Rounds, which is a WebEx, usually with a half an hour presentation, a half an hour of discussion. And it was really um, a very lively discussion about issues like um, why are we waiting on journals? Um, if you know something, why don't you put it on the web and let everybody know about it as opposed to going through these extensive reviews and delays? Um, and uh, how do you put something on the web which speaks to patients, uh, uh, researchers, uh, healthcare providers all at the same time? And you know, one of the great things about the development of the wiki uh, technology is that um, by tagging things now, we think we're going to be able to have people take multiple views of the same subject material and uh, get what is relevant to them. So this is work in progress. It's a little bit of an advertisement, but I hope a lot of people will uh, pitch in and help out. Now again, why be obsessed with ethics and regulatory issues? I actually think this will end up being the main thing that we have to figure out. Um, I'm very confident now we can surmount a lot of the other problems over time, not immediately, but over time. But until we figure out a fluid way to have people participate in the research in a real learning way, to not have to fill out a 20-page consent form or, or pretend that they're reading it, uh, to have things in language they can understand and a way to interact continuously with the system, we're just going to be eking out little pieces of research one bit at a time and fall further and further behind what people really need uh, to make good information. By the way, how many of you think that multivitamins are good? <laughs> I don't know how many of you saw the news today, but the Annals of Internal Medicine apparently just declared that multivitamins are bad, they're not good. Um, and you know, I would just say we don't really know, although most of the trials seem to indicate they're not worth it. So um, another reason to focus is that a lot of other people are focused. So I think there is going to be action this year on the ethics front. I would encourage everybody involved in research to uh, get involved and let your opinion be uh, known. And follow Kevin Weinfurt closely. He's going to be uh, right at the forefront of this. Um, all right, now what about this new national network? And um, I have to be careful here. I've gotten a, you know, a dozen reprimands already not to say anything. I'm not supposed to say because the announcement is in uh, 20 minutes of uh, who's getting funded. Um, they did fund the coordinating center um, a couple of months ago, so we've been feverishly working on getting ready for the uh, onslaught that you're going to see. So the name of the network is PCORNet. Um, we originally were PCORINet, but 
um, the board of PCORI decided that the best uh, name would really focus on patient-centered outcomes research, not the entity PCORI. So this is meant to be um, a continuous infrastructure that could be around a lot longer than PCORI, depending on how the um, politics go. The uh, goal of the network is to improve the capacity to conduct comparative effectiveness research. And you'll, you'll notice the terms here, large, highly representative national patient-centered clinical research network. If you go back to the roadmap slide almost a decade ago, this is exactly um, what it says. The vision um, is to support a learning uh, U.S. healthcare system. So uh, this will be an infusion of funds to a number of people to create a system which is dedicated to learning in practice. Um, it's really going to be built on the engagement of patients and providers and health system leaders. One of the parts of this that I think is really particularly uh, interesting, um, every application that went in was signed by a health system CEO. I'm pretty convinced they didn't all read what they were signing. <laughs> so when they see what they agreed to, some of them may be in a state of shock, but I think uh, the impetus to not be left out of this is likely to be enough that they'll still uh, follow through. Um, so we're not only, though, talking about using data for observational studies, but interventional comparative effectiveness, that is, randomized clinical trials, both cluster and individually randomized. Um, this will be an open network. That is, people are getting funded as of today, but um, anyone else that wants to participate will be eligible to, to participate in the network because all our proceedings will be publicly um, available and people can develop their own networks to join in. Um, and it will also be available to researchers that are not uh, in the funded entities. So I think this is one of the things that will be hard. Everyone's going to have a better pill to swallow. As I've said before, the sort of the coin of the uh, ring of, um, of uh, a researcher has been uh, controlling the research. So if you're the PI, uh, you're the person. Um, and you not only control the ideas, but the operations uh, are, are under your control. Um, now what we're saying is we're creating a network whose goal is to answer questions, and our main interest is in answering questions. We don't care who comes up with the idea. We're going to vet it, and um, it's not going to be controlled by individual um, PIs. There will still uh, be PIs, but uh, the system uh, is intended to be much more democratic. Um, and we're encouraging all partners, the board uh, of PCORI and the steering committee for the network includes industry, includes multiple branches of government. The NIH has been uh, amazingly supportive um, of, of this um, in the planning phase. This is just a look at one of uh, five or six potential um, diagrams of how we're organized. It's impossible to capture something this complicated in a single diagram unless you had three dimensions and could walk inside of it. But the main thing this is really meant to get across is that the networks are in the middle. And we have a coordinating center. You'll notice it looks eerily like the collaboratory coordinating center, now though with 11 um, groups. And um, this effort is being split um, among Harvard Pilgrim with Rich Platt as a uh, PI. I'm the co-PI on this one, and DCRI uh, will be very involved. The convening will be mostly in Washington, and uh, Mark McClellan with the Brookings Institution will lead the convening. And Academy Health um, is also a major um, part of this with um, they're, they're bringing into play the methods of health services research. And then the ethics uh, group at, um, at Hopkins and Sean Tunis's um, group with uh, involvement of um, stakeholders. So these are people with whom we've worked a lot in the past. Our job is to help the networks get their work done and to make uh, resources available to them. Now I get into dangerous um, ground, and my purpose here is not to show you the details, but just to make the point that much like uh, what Sentinel did, the plan here is not to take people's data and combine it all into one big pie in the sky because we know that that won't work. So this is where the informaticians, I think, are in for a shock. We're all going to get shocks as we uh, convene this network because a lot of the um, applications had elegant um, informatics plans. Um, our plan is more brute force, like Sentinel, to create um, data sets, essentially, uh, in all the network partners, and then only to access the data 
to the extent that it's needed to answer a um, research question. And so a lot of the work that's uh, going on um, is getting ready to um, have a uh, sort of um, interstitial space where questions can be asked. The data is only there as long as it's needed to answer the question, or in the case of uh, many studies, to have at least a data set that's a reproducible research um, element. Um, one of the really nice things about this is with the um, help of FDA and NIH, there's no possessiveness among federal agencies about who paid for what. So this is really a public access effort. And so again, the concept I want to get across is we're not creating a proprietary system that's owned by Harvard Pilgrim or the DCRI or anybody else. This is really meant to just create a different playing field. So the hope is that researchers can focus on research questions and getting answers instead of every time you want to do a study, um, building, it's like building a new um, car every time and then putting it in the junkyard and building a new, a, a new car again the way clinical trials are currently done. What we'd like is a system that's a nationwide system that everybody can use regardless of the funding source or the question that's being um, asked. Um, people have said, well, how can this possibly work? It, it is publicly known that New York City is one of the applicants because the mayor announced that I can talk about it. I can't say whether they got funded. Uh, everyone will find out. I guess in 15 minutes now. It is an unusual procedure because um, PCORI is, uh, it's not a federal agen agency, but it was created by federal law. Uh, all the proceedings have to be public, so people will uh, see the announcement sort of simultaneously when it goes to the board uh, in a public proceeding, which is on the internet. But um, people have said, well, if if it's all of New York City, you've got a bunch of people who have never really worked with each other who now say they can do this. And so um, within the networks, uh, the idea will be to let them do whatever they can do best, but their ultimate goal is to produce a data set that can be accessed by all the other networks. And um, that can happen in a lot of different ways. And so without going into details, um, by the way, we've also had to come up with a nomenclature to describe all these entities because when we think of a clinical research site now, we think of an individual clinic for the most part. Kind of hard to think of New York City as a clinical research site. And so um, there's a nomenclature which I'm sure will evolve when all these people get together. Um, and so again, the concept here is that regardless of what happens inside a network, the contract that they're signing is saying they will make their data available to everyone else. So the hope is that, again, this will create a publicly accessible new playing field where ownership of the data is not the name of the game. The name of the game is having the right question and uh, the ability to analyze the data. All right, so a quick word about the CDRNs. Uh, um, uh, the requirement was at least a million patients um, enrolled um, and involvement of uh, everyone in letters um, of agreement that um, people will um, participate. Um, the range in the applications was 1 million to 28 million covered lives per application, so you can begin to do the math and figure out that it's going to be a large number, um, and, and, and we'll see uh, over the next 24 hours how that uh, comes out. Uh, the applications included every part of the United States. Um, the PPRNs, uh, uh, so there are going to be at least eight of these CDRNs. There are going to be 18 PPRNs. These are patient-powered research networks, and half of them are focused on rare diseases, so very focused patient advocacy groups that of the, of the type uh, many of you know, and half of them uh, will be um, focused on very common diseases. And it's going to be a very interesting um, consortium to have 18 of these uh, networks and then uh, the CDRNs all in a common uh, network. Um, Again, you can see here sort of the, um, the uh, characteristics. Um, and, and what uh, all of these people have agreed to do, uh, of great interest to the NIH and many other people, is to create a system of biospecimens. So um, if everything happens uh, magically the way it's supposed to, um, 18 months from now we'll have millions of biospecimens linked with clinical data um, available. And I think, again, this gives you an idea why the ethics here become so important, because these are data that are critically needed to solve disease problems. Um, and we now know from all the biology 
that we need massive numbers of people to really answer the key questions. And so how we handle the data, what people agree to, and how uh, it's done is going to be a big um, issue. That's sort of an overview of a cornet. And now, uh, what does all this mean um, for us? As I've said, uh, we have the privilege of being coordinating center together with uh, multiple other uh, partners. But this gives us no possession of the data. That's a very different scenario than the world that I've lived in and thrived in in the past. And I want to reassure everybody, and you probably already know this given the many times I've gone out on a limb and been wrong, that our current methods, it's not that they're terrible, they're good. Um, it's just that um, we could do better. So for most people, um, as the system changes, this doesn't really mean that jobs are going to change. Over time, though, I think we all need to get prepared for a change in workflow that will be redirected to a system which has as a primary value transparency and reuse of data, which if you think about it, is the opposite of the way it's been. Uh, research sites will be embedded in integrated health systems, very different than the way it is now. The constructs of ethics and regulation will shift to support learning as a part of healthcare delivery, the opposite of what it is now. And analyses will be conducted in a reproducible research environment. And I don't have time to go into it, but one of the built-in characteristics of a network this vast for observational studies, I would anticipate that we can check a research result almost immediately by having it replicated in another part of the network. And so the false positives that we've gotten so concerned about, I think, can be weeded out fairly quickly. For clinical trials, if we really do reduce the cost by a log order or more, you could begin to think about doing two trials sim simultaneously in different um, parts of the network. And I think the fun of this will be a chance to participate in a system that's uh, being transformed. Again, to reiterate, in the interim, work for most people won't look different. But our hope is that a shift in the environment will launch a new era. And a purpose for the DCRI, I think, needs to be to prepare people for uh, the next generation. For many of you who were around at the time of conversion to EDC or before that, the first just-in-time pharmacy that was developed here. Um, it has been a role that we played, and I would very much look forward to creative thinking, if you can imagine this world, to sort of intersect it so that we're helping to supply the workforce. And then finally, um, there's a lot of uh, reintegration with the Duke health system that needs to be done, because in this world, understanding how health systems work and how to use the data for health systems will be critical. And in that vein, just showing this slide, the main reason I show it is to point out to you that much of the work that needs to be done now, to me, looks a lot more like a clinical trial than it does like uh, the way uh, maybe in the future there will be elegant informatics that will combine everything sort of automatically. There is a huge amount of data curation that will have to go on in the innards of all of these uh, health systems to produce a data set that can then be matched with data sets are from other health systems. And we've been working on this quite a while um, in the Duke Health System. And one of our projects that you, many of you know about um, is beginning now to combine data from multiple counties around the southeast. But the main point of this is not the detail. It's the fact that there are a lot of boxes in here. And every box in here represents hard manual work that somebody has to do to curate data. And I think this is what a lot of the workforce is going to be transformed into doing is getting the data in shape. But once you've done it, then you can use it for a lot of different things because now you have uh, a reliable data set. And then it can be combined with all the other kinds of data that are available societally to um, produce uh, very useful information that goes well beyond uh, hospitals and clinics and into what we really care about most, which is promoting good health and outcomes for people who are living at home, which hopefully is where most of us will continue to live uh, for almost all of our lives. Um, and preliminary work here, I think, is showing that it uh, can be done. But we're only really starting on this journey. So I think uh, for a workforce, um, when I talk about uh, research being done at a uh, log order lower cost, that means uh, tenfold reduction in cost to what we currently have. That does not mean tenfold fewer people. I think it actually means more people. Because as people see that we can actually answer questions, so they'll be able to make the right choices for healthcare decisions, I think the appetite for this is going to grow um, very quickly. 
So in this case, in Durham County, these are now predictions that are being made, not only incorporating medical data, but also data about where people live, uh, where the grocery stores are, and all that other uh, information that we all know is important. So in conclusion, I think um, we, we sort of pass the point of the choice, but just for fun, I like to think about the comparison of the ignorant health system. That's what we currently live in. We build each study and trial as standalone, as if it were a laboratory experiment. And at the end of the study, we try to disseminate the information independently, maintain the primacy of control of the data. The predictable result of this is that we accumulate knowledge very slowly. Many studies are insufficiently powered, so we're not even really accumulating knowledge. We're accumulating a lot of misinformation. And there's a growing gap between science and practice. Um, and the cost in aggregate is enormous. Um, I hope we're now moving to a learning health system which use networks that are uh, now evolving. And we've, I think the FACORNET is the biggest uh, in history, the biggest effort in history to do this. Uh, will require uh, replication and data sharing across the network, uh, bring constituents together at every phase. One of the things I've had a lot of fun thinking about, we're obviously not doing it at this point, would be crowdsourcing with 40 million Americans. What do you think the most important questions are that could be answered that would help you deal with your diseases. Technology um, can make that possible. We sort of have to figure out how to do it. Together, we need to bust bureaucracy that's holding us back. That doesn't mean get rid of bureaucracy. There's really good bureaucracy, but finding out what bureaucracy is needed and what we can get rid of will be important so we can put more people to work doing research and less people to work uh, enforcing rules. And so the possible result of this would be much faster accumulation of knowledge and uh, a plummeting in the cost of each uh, research answer that we get. So finally, uh, obviously, we're now in the statified era. I don't think there's any going back, regardless of what happens with the NSA, which is in the news again. Um, we're all going to have data out there. We live with it every day. And the real goal here, and I think a major mission, of DTMI and DCRI is going to be to help people figure out how to responsibly uh, use the data and involve people to the extent that they're comfortable that we're able to make better recommendations uh, for them uh, with the data that we have. So this is about um, the Obama plan, not the Obama website. Um, hopefully when we open up the uh, PCORNET website um, uh, in about an hour from now, it will function for all the people that um, want to get on it. But um, I came to the conclusion a while ago that we were not going to be able to just make the old system better and fix the problems we currently have. We needed a disruptive solution. And I couldn't be more excited that we're now uh, going to have a chance to try to be disruptive and create a new future for clinical research. So thanks for uh, your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions or comments. Rob, that was uh, really tremendous and uh, enlightening and inspiring. So yeah, no, thank you. You've uh, confirmed what I always tell my kids about the importance of uh, knowing history and being students of history. Normally, this phrase about knowing and being students of history is about so you don't repeat the mistakes of the past. In your case, it's a matter of seeing where the future is going. If you had to just go back to your lectures from 10 and 20 years ago, we would now know where we are now and where we're going to be going in five and 10 years. Um, it is striking to me to see this, and, and there is a lot of truth in the degree to which this was predicted a long time ago by a number of different individuals, and it has taken longer than we anticipated, but is here, which is good to see happening within our lifetime. I think as we move forward, I, I actually don't fear anything. I think this is the future that we had anticipated, predicted, and wanted to happen. And as a DCRI, we're all about innovative clinical research and the ultimate goal of actually making patients better. So the ability that we don't stress every day about spending millions, if not tens and twenties and hundreds of millions of dollars getting the data in is a world we want to work in because it will allow us to answer more questions and ultimately help more patients. So thanks. Thanks, Eric. Rob, this uh, was a great, uh, insightful talk, and I'm wondering how much this could transition 
what's called Obamacare to something that would really be practical and efficient. What is a timeline? Could that possibly happen uh, where this political quagmire we're in now could be replaced with some excitement that we can come up with the best health care system in the world? Well, I, I mean, I think the um, admonition to stay away from politics is still true. But the good news here, at least in my view, Bob, is that um, whether you're talking Democrat or Republican, I think the direction of integration in health care systems is the same. The means by which it gets there may be different in terms of government, private more or less, but um, the direction is towards integrated systems that are quite large. And to function, they're going to have to have this kind of data. And what we used to think of as sort of rarefied clinical research really is the substance of how you figure out what the right thing to do is for people that are in your health system. And then if you extrapolate that and say, given that the object of the study is a human being, um, I think there's an overwhelming global agreement that that should be um, made available to other human beings if you learn something that's useful. And so under either circumstance, controlled in different ways, um, you could see some element of a good old American competition among health systems. But again, the playing field is different. It's not how can you hide the information and use it for just purely proprietary purposes. It's how can you take the information that's there and create the best systems to deliver what people need. Uh, you know, that's an aspiration. We'll see. Have you made a preliminary timeline? Is this a three-year project, a um, five-year, a 50-year? I hope at about the time I'm headed to assisted living, um, <laughs> which you can guess, how, you can, you'll just have to guess how long I think that's going to be. I don't, I don't think it's immediate, but I think, we, I think uh, much like what's happened with the NIH roadmap, some of this, I think, is inevitable because as people, as data becomes more available, it's sort of like uh, what's happened with the internet and totalitarian regimes. It's hard to be totalitarian if people have the information. It's hard to do stupid things in healthcare if people can see what you're doing. And so, you know, I'm optimistic. It's just going to take a while. Practical question for you. <laughs> what do you feel um, the types of uh, skills and expertise are going to be needed to, to fulfill this uh, future? Um, I, I, I don't think that the, um, I think the mainstream skills are going to be the same, but the workflow is going to be different. And then we have this. Um, we have a couple of areas where I think there needs to be a dramatic increase in the workforce. One uh, that we talk about constantly is just quantitative people. If you can do math, um, thinking about applying math to these um, increasingly available data sets is going to be really important, particularly if you can also understand the clinical part. So, um, and I think that's been um, a, a key part of the success of the DCRI over many years. But then we got the data curation part, and I think there the skills range entirely from, um, you know, what I, what I would call just fundamental skills of dealing with medical nomenclature. We're going to need a lot of people who can do that, all the way out to very um, sophisticated, um, abstract concepts of how to develop new informatics systems. But I think we're going to need an army of people in that arena. In fact, in healthcare delivery, independent of thinking about research, that's already needed. But um, we'll never get away from the fact that if you're going to put a human being on a study, there needs to be someone who uh, can go to the bedside or the clinic side and talk to another human being about what's um, being done. So uh, all the other skills we have will be needed. I just think it's going to be a very different workflow that will be much less expensive per uh, question um, answer. Galen, you had a question? You should, it's been a while since I've taken a Galen question. medical centers, and more and more the academic medical centers tend to be led by a single individual. And to what extent uh, have you got buy-in from these leaders of the academic medical centers, and to what extent is that still a major challenge as you really try to bring off these systems? Well, I, I actually don't accept your premise. Um, 
Yes, there is a um, designated leader of uh, what I would call an academic health and science system. Because when you say academic medical center, that brings to mind a, you know, a set of buildings with a few faculty. Um, obviously, there's a big, sprawling $3 billion enterprise at Duke. But there's also a president of the university. There are two sets of boards of trustees to whom, uh, in, in our case, the chancellor um, reports. And there's still a lot that happens um, uh, out um, in the periphery or even in the mainstream. Having said that, um, the part of your premise that I, I do agree with is that there are tighter controls. Um, one, one aspect of big data, if you will, in any system as, as you get better and better in looking at it, that means it's harder to hide things because um, uh, people can see it and uh, leaders will have opinions. Um, I, uh, different people have different leadership styles, but I think ultimately as data become more available, people learn how to use the data. Just like I described with um, patients and healthcare systems, I think the same will happen in academic medicine. In, in fact, you might even ask, um, in a system like ours now where the number of healthcare providers who are not on the main Duke campus exceed the number who are on the main Duke campus, um, what is an academic medical center? And what rights and privileges and uh, degree of input do all those different people need to have? Or another way of saying it is, whatever we're doing now is going to look different five years from now. Okay, well thanks everybody.